Today, I'd like to tell you about some of the work we're doing with small molecules that can be helpful to uh, immunogen uh, presentation. And um, the envelope glycoproteins of HIV, uh, let's see, there's a, there we go. Okay. The envelope glycoproteins of HIV go through uh, varied confirmations in response to receptor binding that's important for virus entry into the target cell. Um, and uh, the CD4 binding um, basically takes this pre-triggered confirmation, state one as we call it, and moves it into an intermediate state two. Um, and then additional CD4 binding uh, moves the envelope glycoproteins into the full CD4 bound confirmation or state three. And then CCR5 binding uh, basically induces additional conformational changes that create the six helix bundle that allow uh, fusion of the viral and the target cell membranes. Now, we've found that uh, many uh, alterations of state one, either amino acid changes, in particular key restraining residues, uh, solubilization in various detergents, uh, lots of manipulation of state one uh, basically results in the envelope glycoproteins assuming uh, this uh, intermediate state two. And hence, we call state two a default confirmation. It seems that that's a confirmation that the envelope glycoprotein is designed to go into when state one is destabilized. Now, uh, all potent and broad neutralizing antibodies uh, basically recognize state one. Uh, most of them are promiscuous. They can also recognize state two. But if they don't recognize state one, they tend to be uh, relatively weak or uh, non-active at all at neutralization. Um, by contrast, uh, these downstream confirmations, state two and state three, are uh, uh, eliciting uh, high titers of poorly neutralizing antibodies during natural infection. And in fact, many of the antibodies that we generate with vaccine candidates um, are uh, in this category. They, they don't recognize state one very effectively and therefore uh, have problems uh, e uh, either with breath or potency. So um, uh, Roe here did a pretty nice job of summarizing our published work, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, Cross-linking mass spectrometry of cell surface cleaved envelope glycoproteins uh, show that there are differences between state one envelopes on the cell membrane and uh, structures of envelope that have uh, been prepared in various ways. Um, and as you've seen, all of those structures are, are well characterized and essentially uh, identical. Um, but we should keep in mind that there are differences between these structures and uh, state one, at least as it exists on uh, a cell membrane. And uh, I'll show you that what we see for cleaved envelope on the cell membrane is actually a pretty good mimic of what's on the virus and what is functional. Uh, SM FRET studies, which you've heard about, uh, suggest that these uh, uh, structures are actually corresponding mostly to this default confirmation, state two. And uh, this work has led uh, us to question, what is state one? And uh, to raise the hypothesis that um, if we could present state one to the immune system in a more consistent way, if we could somehow enrich state one in our immunogens, might we do better at eliciting potent and broad neutralizing antibodies than we're currently doing? So um, to test that hypothesis, we have to basically uh, get envelope immunogens that are enriched in state one. And today I'm going to address uh, two questions that uh, we've been uh, making some progress towards. Uh, first of all, how can we stabilize this metastable state one confirmation, this very labile confirmation of the envelope glycoproteins? And what is the source of state one envelope? Can we rely on the cell surface envelope? Do we have to use virus-like particles? Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about that today. Now, um, early on, um, studies of inhibitors of HIV entry um, used some of these uh, BMS uh, compounds. Um, we discovered other uh, analogs in a random screen in my lab, uh, and they all work the same way. Essentially, uh, they decrease the transitions of the envelope from state one uh, to state two. 
And that would uh, suggest that uh, those compounds, um, these small molecules, should be able to uh, stabilize envelope in state one, or at least enrich preparations in state one. Um, there is some SM FRET data which supports that um, hypothesis, but we also wanted to look at envelope glycoprotein antigenicity in the presence of these compounds and ask, um, do they really stabilize state one? Um, and so uh, I'll show you a, a number of uh, pieces of data today that suggest that that's the case. Um, this is a cell surface uh, envelope immunoprecipitation. So we're taking envelope glycoproteins that are on the surface of expressing cells, and we're incubating them with various uh, antibodies, neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies, in the uh, presence or absence of um, BMS-806, the uh, parental compound. Um, then the uh, cells are washed, so we wash away the unbound antibodies. Um, those cells are lysed, and then we capture the envelope antibody complexes on protein acephoros. And the uh, captured envelope glycoproteins are then western blotted with anti-GP120 or anti-GP41 antibodies. So we can see uh, what are the envelope forms that are being recognized by the antibodies. And this just shows you a typical result. So um, here's the input uh, envelope proteins in that cell lysate, the GP160 envelope uh, uncleaved precursor, GP120 and GP41. Um, and I'll lead you through this because it's a complicated slide, but the important thing to see is that when you look at poorly neutralizing antibodies, all those antibodies that see state two and state three, what they primarily recognize on the cell surface is the uncleaved envelope. And um, they recognize that even more poorly in the presence of BMS-806. By contrast, all of the broadly neutralizing antibodies against GP120 and GP41 all see the cleaved envelope glycoprotein, GP120, GP41. And in the presence of BMS-806, that recognition is either maintained or enhanced. And many such experiments have been uh, quantitated and, and uh, statistically analyzed, and I'm summarizing that here. So if we look at the cleaved envelope glycoproteins on the cell surface, first of all, there's a, a very significant difference between the recognition of those proteins by broadly neutralizing antibodies and by poorly neutralizing antibodies. So that's highly significant um, in, in its difference, and it suggests that the cleaved envelope glycoproteins on the cell surface are actually a very good mimic of the functional envelope glycoproteins on the virus. The other thing you can see is that when you look at the um, recognition of uh, the envelope glycoproteins, the cleaved envelope glycoproteins by the um, antibodies, by broadly neutralizing antibodies, um, BMS-806 uh, increases the recognition of most of those antibodies, and uh, BMS-806 decreases the recognition of the uncleaved envelope um, by poorly neutralizing antibodies. And we know that uncleaved envelope is sampling many conformations. Uh, this is telling us that BMS-806 can decrease uh, those less desirable conformations. Now, we did a similar set of studies on virus-like particles. Um, again, we're binding antibodies in the presence or absence of BMS-806, washing away the unbound antibodies, lysing the virions, and then capturing uh, the antibody envelope complexes. Um, the answers are actually quite similar. You can see that the poorly neutralizing antibody recognition is all decreased by BMS-806 treatment whereas the recognition by broadly neutralizing antibodies is either maintained or, in many cases, particularly for the quaternary antibodies, um, increased by BMS-806 uh, incubation. And this just shows you that when you look at the cleaved envelope glycoprotein on the cell surface and on the virus-like particles, there's a very strong correlation between the effect of BMS-806 on those uh, two sets of um, envelope glycoproteins. Uh, again, supporting the idea that what we see for cleaved envelope on the cell surface is a pretty good mimic of what's on the virus uh, particle itself. 
Now, the other um, phenomenon that we found when we were doing these studies is that BMS 806 can actually strengthen the very labile interaction between GP120 and the rest of the envelope glycoprotein complex. Um, so this is a study where we're taking envelope glycoproteins that are uh, his tagged on the C terminus, and we're capturing them with nickel NTA beads in either DMSO, the control um, vehicle here, or uh, BMS 806, or in some cases we're using soluble CD4 or a CD4 mimetic uh, small molecule. And uh, this just shows you the input here, um, and this is what's captured on nickel NTA beads. And you can see in the presence of DMSO, uh, we bring down GP41 and the uncleaved precursor because they have the his tags on them, but you can see that the amount of GP120 that's brought down is actually quite low. However, that's increased when you incubate these complexes with BMS806. Um, the GP120 is completely shed when you add soluble CD4 or a CD4 mimetic compound. Um, and that's uh, seen for two different primary strains of HIV-1, this stimulating effect of BMS-806 on uh, the association of GP-120 with the envelope uh, complex. So uh, the mature cleaved HIV envelope trimer on the cell surface mimics the functional state 1 envelope on the virus. BMS-806 decreases the exposure of epitopes for poorly neutralizing antibodies and maintains or increases the exposure of epitopes for most BNABs, and that's consistent with the stabilization of a state one-like conformation. Uh, and BMS-806 stabilizes the non-covalent association of GP120 with the envelope complex. Now, um, because these BMS compounds appear to uh, enrich for state one conformations, we thought, they might be useful if we could treat immunogens with them to present state one uh, in a more enriched fashion to the immune system. Um, but as we've heard, to generate uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, we're going to need sustained presentation of the right conformation to the immune system. So you'd like to have small molecules working that have uh, very long-acting effects. And so we tried to ask, could we improve the uh, available BMS-like compounds to make them long-acting. And uh, we uh, looked at uh, some of the available crystal structures that Marie Pansera and Peter Kwong had solved of BMS compounds in SOSIP trimers, and uh, they show that these compounds basically insert into a hydrophobic pocket on GP120 uh, that's near the alpha-1 helix. And they all insert with the uh, phenyl ring pointing deep into the pocket. And we did some modeling that suggested that <clears throat> we might be able to add uh, photoactivatable groups to the other end of the molecule, which is sticking out of the pocket. And uh, these might make additional favorable contacts that al might allow these compounds to bind with um, higher affinity and, and uh, greater duration. <coughs> So uh, this just shows you uh, one set of analogs that we made, uh, starting with um, BMS-529, one of the parental compounds. When we add um, this diazerine um, uh, moiety to the phenyl ring, which is pointing into that pocket, we basically completely lose antiviral activity. So you, you can't fiddle around with that end of the molecule very much. But as the uh, uh, modeling predicted, um, if you uh, modify the methyl triazole end of the compound um, with a number of different moieties, uh, including diazerine and azide photoactivatable groups, um, you get uh, full activity. So um, those are the compounds that I'm going to be telling you about uh, for the remainder of the talk. Um, this just shows you a, a FRET analysis um, where we're labeling the uh, GP120 um, on one protomer with V1 and V4 probes. Um, as uh, has been shown for primary envelopes, they all show um, a high uh, propensity to uh, remain in this state 1 conformation. Um, and when we add these photoactivatable compounds, basically that state 1 uh, confirmation is uh, totally maintained or in some cases even increased a little bit. So um, they're compatible with a state one confirmation. Uh, 
Um, all of these uh, compounds um, still tighten or strengthen the association of GP120 with the envelope complex. So um, here is the nickel NTA pull down. And again, in DMSO, uh, only a little bit of GP120 is brought down. Uh, with the parental compound, the 10 micromolar, BMS806, um, brings down more GP120. And these are results from 1 and 10 micromolar, 1 and 10 micromolar of two of these other analogs. And you can see that um, they act uh, similarly to uh, tighten the association of GP120 with the complex. Um, and uh, since those studies were done in detergent, we also wanted to ask, does BMS806 uh, strengthen GP120 uh, envelope uh, interaction in physiological conditions. So here we're taking virus-like particles and we're just looking at the shedding of GP120 from those virus-like particles. So we're looking at the supernatants here. Um, at day zero, there's not much GP120 shed, um, but at, uh, after four days in DMSO, you can see uh, uh, GP120 gets shed into the supernatant of those virus-like particles. Um, and if we add uh, BMS806 or one of these compounds um, at various points, you can see that you decrease that shedding. Um, and that's true at both 4 degrees and at 37 degrees. Um, and then we wanted to ask about the longevity of this activity. Um, do these compounds um, have the ability to uh, maintain a state one conformation for a long period of time uh, in various envelope preparations. So uh, what we did is we set up an assay uh, to look at the conformational changes um, in the antigenicity of the envelope glycoproteins on virus-like particles. So we take virus-like particles, um, we incubate them with these BMS um, analogs or with DMSO, in some cases, we UV irradiate um, to, to cross-link the um, analog. In other cases, we uh, only mock irradiate. Um, then the virus is pelleted and washed, and then it's resuspended in PBS for different lengths of time. So we've done this for uh, as short as half an hour, and we've done this for as long as three weeks. Um, just ask, um, can the conformational changes be maintained after a single administration of, and, and washing of the compound. And then the virus is pelleted and we lyse it and uh, analyze it um, with antibodies. So the antibodies I'll show you uh, in the next few slides um, are uh, 2G12, which recognizes uh, state one, state two, and state three, um, and 19B, which is a V3 uh, poorly neutralizing antibody, which uh, can only recognize state two or state three and doesn't recognize um, state one. So um, with BMS compounds, we expect that if they enrich for state one, we're gonna see a loss of recognition by 19B, while retention of recognition by 2G12. So that's what the assay is looking for, and, and this is a typical example of such an assay. So the input envelopes uh, are shown over here, this is a, with a control antibody here, uh, human IgG. And then if we look over here at the 2G12 precipitation, you can see that uh, this is after a 20 hours uh, of washing uh, the, vi the virus-like particles. Um, compared with DMSO, um, the VLPs uh, treated with uh, either of these analogs show very little difference. So that's what we expect either before or after washing. Um, and here we're using the uh, parental BMS-806 and the BMS-529. Um, <clears throat> now, with 19B, uh, you can see that compared to DMSO, when you initially incubate with uh, BMS-806, you get a decrease, and BMS-529, you get a decrease. <coughs> and then after 20 hours of washing, you see that uh, the BMS-806 effect is partially reversed, and uh, the BMS529 effect um, mostly persists. Um, but then as you do longer washes, um, for example, a two-day wash, you can see that uh, now you reverse not only the BMS806 effect, but now the BMS529 effect is largely reversed. And that's true also of uh, a four-day wash as well. So the parental compounds can induce a state one-like conformation but 
they come off after a relatively slow off rate, but they come off after two or three days. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you the same experiment now done with some of these AEG analogs that we've designed. And you can see that, uh, again, the 2G12 controls uh, basically don't show much of an effect as we expect. Um, and now when you incubate with these compounds compared to the DMSO control, you can see 19B uh, is dramatically reduced initially, uh, but it's, it's reduced as well uh, after three weeks of washing. And in this case, in this lane, we've UV irradiated the uh, VLP uh, compound complexes, and the result uh, is that you don't actually need UV irradiation to see the effects. So these are long-acting effects. Um, they, they do depend upon the um, photoactivatable groups, but they aren't dependent on uh, UV irradiation. So um, this just shows you a control here where we've made a compound that's identical to one of the active compounds, but it has no photoactivatable group. Um, and you can see that uh, that effect uh, here is reversed by about seven days of washing. So it's not too dissimilar from some of the parental compounds. And then uh, finally, we uh, took these compounds and incubated them with um, envelope uh, glycoproteins on VLPs. Uh, in this case, we UV irradiated them and then two weeks later asked what was their antigenicity. And you can see every third lane is what you're most interested in because that's where you have UV and the compound, uh, not just UV alone. Um, and you can see the poorly neutralizing antibodies just don't recognize that very efficiently. All of the broadly neutralizing antibodies um, see that complex quite efficiently. And in some cases, we can actually see uh, interprotomer linkages, which are uh, induced by the UV cross-linking. So um, BMS-806 analogs stabilize a state one like HIV envelope conformation. Um, by definition, they should reduce the epitopes for poorly neutralizing antibodies while maintaining both, most BNAB epitopes. Um, the photoactivatable BMS-806 analogs induce conformational changes in envelopes similar to those induced by the parental compounds, BMS-806 and BMS-529. Um, with little reversibility two to three weeks after a single exposure. Um, and the photoactivatable group contributes to the low reversibility of the analog's effects. Um, the long-term effects of these photoactivatable BMS-806 analogs on end conformation uh, doesn't depend on, but may be actually enhanced by exposure to UV light. So we haven't done uh, super long-term studies, but um, those could be done and uh, might be relevant as we look at uh, preparing immunogens um, with this type of approach. And uh, in terms of the relevance to vaccine development, long-acting BMS-806 analogs could enrich state one-like conformations in uh, some HIV envelope preparations, allowing the hypothesis to be tested that if we enrich envelopes in state one, which is the major target for broadly neutralizing antibodies, we might uh, do a little bit better job in eliciting those broadly neutralizing antibodies, which I think uh, so far has uh, been a, a very difficult and elusive goal. So I'd like to thank all of the people involved in this work, particularly Shi Tao Zhou and Shi Zhang Zhang in my lab, um, Althea Gaffney and Amos Smith's lab at the University of Pennsylvania, Hai Tao Ding and John Kappas at UAB, um, Walter Mothis, Malin Lu, Scott Blanchard for the fret work, and uh, Mohammed Mohammadi and Cameron Abrams lab at Drexel for the modeling. And I'd like to uh, thank all of our funders and uh, thank you for your attention. So.